Thank you so much for coming to tonight's event. I'm Jonathan Brent, Executive Director of the EVO Institute. And I, I, I want to preface these remarks, uh, first of all, with thanks to uh, the family of, of Ruth Gay for making uh, the Ruth Gay seminars uh, possible. This is, this is one of them. Uh, their generous support over the years has produced a very remarkable series of wonderful lectures and events. <clears throat> the series is given by scholars who have conducted research and in the EVO archives, and I believe there is some family in attendance, and if you are, I'd like to recognize you. Uh, Ruth Gay's sister, yes. And the other uh, big thanks this evening is to the Seedlings Foundation that has made possible for us the naming of uh, the visiting scholar uh, uh, for this evening, uh, Gennady Estreich, uh, as the first Albert B. Ratner visiting scholar at EVO, uh, funded by the Seedlings Foundation. This is now the third uh, such position we have at EVO, the purpose of which is to build, rebuild the educational infrastructure of this organization. Uh, there is the Cronhill, uh, the Jacob Cronhill Professor of East European Jewish History, the Albert B. Ratner uh, visiting professor of East European Jewish literature, and the Atran professor of Yiddish language and linguistics. We hope to add two more positions, one in music and one in ethnography, and this will provide YIVO with a robust uh, uh, a scholarly infrastructure that will enable us to teach and to direct research uh, that is necessary for the production of knowledge about the great narrative of Jewish life in Eastern Europe and Russia over a thousand years. That narrative has not ever been written in full or with the kind of nuance and complexity that is possible. And these professorships and the uh, the new educational programs that we have started at EVO in the Weinreich Center and with the leadership of uh, Jennifer Young, who is uh, our educational uh, director of educational programs, are leading the way nationally for the study of East European and Russian Jewish history. And I want to say a couple of words about this because I think uh, we are living now at a moment, uh, a very special moment, that has seen the following things happen. And if you put these together, you realize that there is something going on in the world right now. The first of these is the opening of the Warsaw Museum of the, uh, of the history of Polish Jews. The opening will take place in October, this October in a few weeks. Uh, it is a monumental accomplishment, uh, this museum. It has drawn the attention of people worldwide. And on October 21st, the Evo Institute, in partnership with the museum, will have an installation and an exhibition at the city, at the Museum of the City of New York of the home movies that have been sitting in our archives for some 50 years. And um, I urge you all to come. It is a spectacular installation, a spectacular exhibition. It will show you something of the life of that world that has been 
obscured, in fact, not just obscured, but suppressed for years and years and years and years in the post-Holocaust world. It is something that has been very difficult to face. And I would say that this is connected in some odd way with the translation of waiting for Godot into Yiddish. Can you imagine such a thing? This great classic of existentialist French English literature being translated into Yiddish and for many initially it seemed so odd. Why would you do this? We know the play in English already. Why do I have to go and, and watch a translation of it? And yet, the translation of Waiting for Godot brought a Jewish dimension of that play out that was certainly there. The character of Vladimir in the original script was Levy, who had been a concentration camp survivor. This is little known, but it was certainly part of Beckett's world. But nevertheless, that this translation is then deemed to be so important in the world of Beckett scholarship and Beckett performance that they are invited to the Belfast Festival in Ireland, where it is a sensation and gets the top reviews of performances of Beckett. And I would add one more component to this. I would add the new project that the YIVO Institute is undertaking in Vilnius to digitize all of our pre-war collections that have been sitting and moldering in, in the basement of a church where many of these materials were put in 1948. And for the last 70 years, almost, have been sitting and quietly deteriorating and turning into dust. And we now have the agreement of the Lithuanian government and the archive and the library to go and digitize these materials, to preserve these materials, and to make them available to scholarship. And what all of these projects have in common is a re-knitting together of the fragments of Jewish history. A, 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 a bringing together, so to speak, a realization of, of the hackneyed afikomen component of the Passover Seder. But the bringing together of fragments of Jewish experience and the recreating of a wholeness of our lives, I think, is something that almost worldwide the Jewish community is interested in doing. Perhaps blindly, perhaps not really even realizing what we're doing, but the time has come to do this. And it is a wonderful moment, and it is a moment that the Evo Institute is intent on trying to capture with our programs, with our, with, with our, in, in our archives, in our library, and in our educational programs. And so I want to invite you to think about this work of creating a whole narrative of our people. And part of that whole narrative is the encounter with communism. It's one that, like so many others, is complicated, and many people would sooner avoid it than not. Uh, I remember a few years ago uh, at, a, at a conference uh, I asked how many in the audience had been Trotskyites, and about half the audience raised their hands. And, um, and uh, I remember very well uh, uh, Leszek Kolakowski, the Polish uh, philosopher, saying to me once when I asked him about Trotskyism, he said, oh, that's a Jewish disease. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Jewish neurosis, he said to me. Uh, and, and perhaps he was right. 
But nevertheless, it, it is perhaps time for us to take stock uh, of, of this neurosis and try to work our way through this and to try to re-knit our present narrative with that which in the 1930s and 40s seemed so vivid and important and so difficult. And people were faced with choices that, that today, in hindsight, seem easy to avoid, but which then seemed impossible to avoid. Um, Gennady Estreich, who is going to be speaking this evening on the farewell to communism, Howard Fast and Soviet Yiddish writers, is clinical associate professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies and Rausch associate professor of Yiddish studies in New York University. Gennady is an internationally recognized authority on Yiddish language and literature and Eastern European Jewish history. He has worked at the Oxford Institute of Yiddish Studies and the London University School of Oriental and African Studies. He's the author of numerous publications, including Soviet Yiddish, Language Planning and Linguistic Development, In Harness, Yiddish Writer's Romance with Communism, and In Yiddish Literary, uh, in, in Yiddish Literary Life in Moscow, in Russian, which is forthcoming. He's the co-author and co-editor of Captive of the Dawn, The Life and Work of Peretz Markish, and 1929, Mapping the Jewish World. Um, Dr. Estreich will be our visiting scholar from starting now and will be giving courses and lectures and mentoring students here at EVO. I urge you to sign up for his classes. Um, uh, he is, I have never taken one of his courses, but all of his students have told me, a fantastic teacher, a riveting uh, uh, scholar and, and, and teacher. Before I end this evening, I want to thank very much Helena Gindi for preparing this evening. Uh, and uh, she's ill and cannot attend, unfortunately. And I want to thank um, uh, all of the EVO staff for the uh, uh, reception upstairs. And I was glad that so many of you came to it. Uh, now, Gennady Estreich. Thank you so much. It is in general very nice to be a visiting scholar at here. It is a very hospitable place here. Yeah? And somehow I feel here in, in my element in, in a sense here. Yeah? Uh, by the way, uh, to continue with Trotsky on November the 7th, if I am not wrong, is his birthday. But uh, I, am not, I understand that it's not on the calendar of, of Eva. Uh, and today will be uh, in the center uh, of my paper, there will be a, uh, a person whose birthday is very close, November the 11th, and it's 100th anniversary of Howard Fest. During the last, is it okay, the sound? Yeah? During the last 12 years, the period of time that I have uh, been teaching at uh, New York University, I would from time to time mention Howard Fest uh, to my students. And as far as I remember, it was always without any exception, a new name to them. Then I would usually remind them about the 1960 film Spartacus, starring Kirk Douglas. Even if they had a chance to see this film, that was also quite exotic, they didn't know that it was based on Fast's uh, novel, part of his literary legacy. In 1949, the publisher Weekly wrote, and I quote, Howard Fest's My Glorious Brothers, which was re released a year uh, before 1948, a story of the uh, Maccabees sold particularly well during the festival of Hanukkah in December and will sell again next year. It was in 1949. The situation has changed dramatically since then. Although the Library of Congress catalog lists several recent reprints of Fast's novel, 
novels, including My Glorious Brothers, his name is not a household one uh, anymore these days. <clears throat> Howard Fest was born, as I mentioned before, in November 1914, 100 years ago, and lived a relatively long and certainly eventful life, mainly in New York and not far from uh, New York. He died in March uh, 2007. His father was a Ukrainian immigrant whose name was shortened from Fastovsky upon his arrival to uh, in, uh, arrival in America. Fastov, Fastovsky, uh, Fastov is a town not far from Kiev. Sholom Aleichem spent some time in Fastov. I mention it because according to some sources, Harvard Fast, uh, his grandmother was Sholom Aleichem's sister. I'm not sure 100%, but I came across such a thing. This fact, however, however didn't m uh, make Fast a Yiddish speaker. In general, he grew up quite detached from uh, Jewish languages and traditions. Uh, his schooling was very basic. When his mother died in 1923 and his father became unemployed, Howard's younger brother, Julius, went to live uh, with relatives, while he and his older brother, Jerome, also a prolific writer later, uh, worked by selling newspapers. He created his early voracious reading uh, to his part-time job in uh, New York Public Library. Fast began writing at an early age, I would say very early age. His first novel came out in 1933 when he was 18. His most popular, well, perhaps the most popular, was Citizen Tom Paine, a fictional account of the life of Thomas Paine. He was always interested in American history and wrote about it. His 19, uh, 1944 novel, Freedom Road, is about the, the lives of former slaves during Reconstruction. It, uh, it was made into a film in 1979, starring Muhammad Ali in a very rare acting role, playing uh, uh, Gideon Jackson, an ex-slave who became a senator in uh, Washington, D.C. Fast spent World War II years uh, uh, employed uh, with the United States Office of War Information, writing for Voice of America. And in 1943, he joined the Communist Party of the United States. And in 1950, he was called before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. In his testimony, he refused to disclose the names of contributors to a fund for a home of orphans of American veterans of the Spanish Civil War, and as a result was imprisoned for a few months for contempt of Congress. During this uh, uh, time in incarceration, he began writing Spartacus, a novel about an uprising among Ro Roman slaves. And I, of course, Spartacus was an important symbol in the communist movement. Actually, the uh, communist party in Germany started as a group called Spartacus, Spartacus with uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, and in general, I grew up with Spartacus here. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, blacklisted by major publishing houses, Fest uh, was forced to publish the novel himself. By the standards of a self-publishing book, it was a great success, uh, going through seven uh, printings in the first four months of publication. In 1952, Fest ran for a Bronx congressional seat on uh, the American Communist Party uh, uh, Labor on the American Communist Labor Party ticket. During the 1950s, he uh, was uh, uh, writing for the communist newspaper, The Daily Worker. In 1953, and this is a very important moment, he was awarded the Stalin Peace Prize, a very high award, of course, in the communist. Uh, movement. The United States State Department had refused uh, his, him, uh, his uh, visa, so he couldn't receive it in Moscow. Uh, about 1,000 uh, people attended the presentation ceremony in New York. The singer Paul Robson, uh, winner of the Stalin uh, Prize in 1952, this was in 1953. Uh, took part in the proceedings. Yesterday I had a conversation with my relative who lives now in uh, Seattle, and he's uh, 12 years older than me, and he, he told me that I remember 
that when I was a child, there were two heroes, American heroes in our life, Howard Fast and Paul Robson. These were two symbols. In 1952, he established his own uh, press, the called Blue uh, Heron Press, which allowed him to continue publishing under his own name throughout the period of his uh, blacklisting. Just as the production of the film version of Spartacus uh, is considered a milestone in the breaking of the Hollywood blacklist, the reissue of uh, uh, the novel Spartacus by Crown Publishers in 1958 effectively ended his own blacklisting within the American publishing industry. In fact, Fest's uh, blacklisting came to an end following his public break with the communist movement, and this period in his life will be in focus of this presentation. As a historian of Jewish intellectual life, especially of individuals and organizations associated with Yiddish culture, I became interested in Howard Fest only when his name emerged in the context of the events which followed Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech delivered at a closed session of the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in February 1956. Actually, around this time, on the 14th of October, today is what, in a week's time, there will be the uh, 50th, uh, another anniversary, the 50th anniversary of getting rid of Nikita Khrushchev. It was a sort of a coup, and it's exactly 50 years uh, since his disappearing. But then in 1956, he, uh, with this uh, secret speech, his speech was uh, sharply critical, as you know, of the reign of Joseph Stalin, who died in March 1953, particularly with respect to the brutal purges of the party and state apparatus, which had uh, particularly m m uh, marked the last years of the 1930s, especially this uh, 1937. This is in, in the history of the Soviet Union, considered as a terrible year, with hundreds of thousands of people perished. Khrushchev charged Stalin with having uh, fostered a leadership personality cult, despite ostensibly maintaining support for the ideals of communism. The speech launched the process of destalinization in the Soviet Union as well as in, in the entire communist movement, including the United States. I was interested in describing and analyzing the destalinization drive among American uh, Yiddish communists, or Yiddish-speaking communists, those who grouped around the New York Daily Morgan Feierheit, and I wrote about it in my book, Yiddish in the Cold War, that came out eight years ago. Eight? Yes. Uh, six years ago. Uh, while doing my research, I was surprised to come across Harvard Fest. People of my Soviet generation, or better those uh, who are 10 or more years older than I, usually know his name or even remember reading some of his novels. In the Soviet Union, he was really a household name, especially until the mid-1950s. In the American Communist Party, he was hailed as its leading intellectual. Fest's reputation was very high, uh, coming back to, to the Soviet Union, where his books appeared in Russian and other languages. I came across translation into a Komi language, let alone some really exotic, uh, can be called ex exotic languages of uh, the Soviet Union. And students, students of English in the Soviet Union would read his writings as part of their in-class and home-class assignments. Soviet scholars studied his texts. For instance, in 1955, a dissertation on his novel's stylistics was defended at the Central Asian State University in Tashkent, and he appeared as the fighter for democracy in a dissertation defended in 1956 at the uh, or nowadays Chernivtsi State University. Still, he wasn't a character of my research, of Jewish intellectual life. He actually became my character when I was sitting here at Eva about 10 years ago. I was looking at the papers of Paul Pesach Novik, editor of a uh, uh, New York-based communist Yiddish daily newspaper, this uh, Morgan Freiheit. Novik was a central figure in my story and remains a central figure in my story. And his archival collection gave me uh, very important insights. I don't remember if I had even ordered the fast-related papers. Perhaps I saw the file, as I remember, uh, with the 
fast letters and letters too fast in one of the boxes containing other material. You know, you, you get a box. You order something and you get a box. And quite often, of course, I, I look into other files and suddenly fast. Uh, the correspondence between him and Novik turned out to be rich in content, especially because both sides of the conversation are preserved. Novik wrote his letter initially in Yiddish. Then someone translated them into English. It's very interesting to compare. Quite often his Yiddish was stronger and, and, and uh, English a bit milder, you know, somehow edited, whatever. Uh, so both Novik's and Fast letters found a place in Novik's archive. So uh, a few lines was about Novik. Novik was born in September 1891, so he was older, in Brest-Litovsk, now Brest in Belarus, and was a staff member of newspapers in Minsk, Vilna, Warsaw, and New York, where he wrote for the uh, forwards, for the, the Jewish uh, the forward, until a split developed in, in the Jewish Socialist Federation, and he and some colleagues left to found the Freiheit, the Freedom, the communist newspaper in 1925. He was its uh, first news editor of this communist newspaper and had been editor-in-chief from 1939 until it ceased publication in September 1988, symbolically on Rosh Hashanah, because the uh, soaring expenses, shrinking circulation, and, and the death of long-time benefactors. A veteran of the party with a quarter of a century long history of endorsing each permutation of the Kremlin's general line, Novi gradually transformed into a critical observer of Soviet politics. From the hindsight of the late uh, uh, 1980s, he recalled, and I quote, there was a process. You don't just grow out of your skin overnight. Khrushchev's speech was a breaking point. Then there was Howard Fest, the naked god, in 1957, end of quote. The book entitled The Naked God, The Writer and the Communist Party, a very interesting book actually, appeared in 1957, written by Fast in an attempt to describe and explain the difficulty of leaving the communist movement. This is when you read, and I, maybe some of you read it, you can feel even the pain, the pain of leaving the movement, and he explains this pain. Until, and he did it, uh, so he stayed in the movement until the final devastating blow of Khrushchev's secret speech. And I quote how one uh, author describes it. So he left, shattered, uh, so the speech shattered a soul already torn to shreds by 13 years of service to what he called the naked God. Therefore the title, the naked, the naked God. Importantly, in April 1956, there was a Yiddish newspaper, Volkstimme. It was a communist, of course, newspaper, because Poland at that time was a, a satellite, a communist satellite of the Soviet Union. So this Volkstimme published an article which focused on specifically Jewish aspects of the Stalinist purges. Most importantly, the liquidation of the Jewish anti-fascist committee established in the Soviet Union at the beginning of the uh, war with the Nazis. And uh, uh, this, the newspaper wrote also uh, 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 about execution, some details, uh, they, they knew very little, of such uh, leading cultural figures as uh, the Yiddish writers David Bergelson, Peres Markis, Leib Kvitka, David Hofstein, and, and Isaac Pfeffer. The chairman of the committee, Solomon Michoels, was m murdered earlier in January 1948 in a staged accident. The names of Michoels and Pfeffer were particularly well known in the United States, which they visited in 1943, both of them, as a delegation, a representatives, a unique case in general. This was the first and essentially the last Soviet Jewish delegations that visited the Soviet Union, the United States. Many Yiddish readers also remembered David Bergelson, who spent almost six months in America in 1928. He arrived and left in uh, 1929. Uh, in the beginning of February, February the 1st, 1957, the New York Times featured on its front page an article entitled Reds Denounced by Howard Fest. This was a front page. The additional uh, editorial writer, Harry Schwartz, broke the news about Fest's departure from the Communist 
Party of the United States. Mentioning Nikita Khrushchev's destalinization speech, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and the Folkstimme article, this is a separate story about the Folkstimme article, how, how it appeared and how it uh, was uh, recycled in the United States, but it's a separate story. So he mentioned the speech and the Folkstimme article as the main reasons for his ideological change or, or transformation. Still, Fast stated that he was, quote, neither anti-Soviet nor anti-communist and invoked the protection of the Fifth Amendment when a few weeks, weeks later, the House Un-American Activities Committee wanted him to appear before them as a friendly witness. As you remember, he spent, you know, with his previous experience with this committee, he was sent to prison. But still, once again, he rejected to be uh, a friendly uh, witness. Characteristically, after reading the article in the New York Times, Novik wrote to Fast on the same day a friendly letter asking his permission. It was in general not about this, his uh, departure from the party. He just asked his permission uh, to use the folk steam as translation of uh, Fast novel, uh, uh, Lola Gray, for running it in Morgan Freiheit. They have absolutely technical uh, qu question. It seems that in February, Fast's departure from the communist movement was a sort of a partial one, not exactly. In the March issue of the left-wing journal uh, mainstream, uh, Fast wrote about his conclusion that the Soviet variety of socialism represented socialism without morality. Still, the mainstream editors were glad, and I quote, uh, to hear the note of solidarity in his arguments. Uh, therefore, they didn't think the differences between him, it's again a quote, and his former comrades, sharp as they are, uh, need be uh, exacerbated so that a, a hostile uh, chasm lies between them. The April, April issue of Mainstream allocated 15 pages for critical discussion of Fest's departure or declarations. In June, Fest's name uh, again appeared in the New York Times when he decided to make known his correspondence with the Soviet novelist Boris Polevoy, uh, who was a chairman of the Foreign Commission of the party-run Writers' Union, Soviet Writers' Union. In 1955, Polivoy and a few other Soviet literati visited New York, where they rejected all the stories about executions of Yiddish writers. In general, it was many times there was this rejection, it was a lie, capitalists, imperialists, and so on, uh, yellow press, it, they're, they're alive. And, and uh, in his letter, Fest recalled Polivoy lying then to the effect that the Yiddish writer Leib Kvitka was alive and well and living in uh, uh, the, the same apartment where Polivoy uh, uh, and, and so on. So this was a story that he reminded him. William Foster, who at that time was uh, uh, the chairman emeritus of the Communist Party of the United States, tried to remedy the situation presenting Fast as a naive intellectual demoralized by the novel, complex, and dismaying problem of the Stalin cult of uh, the individual and its Hungarian aftermath. He reminded first that his uh, gigantic body of uh, readers in the socialist countries demanded from uh, him, quote, very definite leadership responsibilities to the proletarians of the world and ask him to wake up to the fact and begin to act accordingly. Still, in, uh, uh, still by August 1957, Fast fin finally broke with the communist circles. It became clear after the publication in forwards of Shimon Weber's article, in Yiddish of course, Howard Fast tells why he departed from the communist from, uh, from the communists, based on, on uh, Shimon Weber's uh, two-day-long conversation with the writer. It's a very comprehensive, very long uh, article in, in two installments. Uh, Weber, who later, in, uh, from 1970 until 1987, 
uh, was the editor-in-chief of the forwards. And Novik were just enemies, sworn enemies. Weber began his journalist career actually at the Morgan Freiheit. But in 1939, he joined the forwards, which was, in his own uh, definition, the only really outspoken American Yiddish anti-communist paper. In his conversation with Weber, Fast recalled his trip to Paris in 1949. He went there as a delegate of the World Congress of Peace. His conviction for contempt of Congress was still in the appeals process. But the sentencing uh, judge, despite Fest's uh, pessimism, approved his uh, obtaining a passport. And, and I, now I'll bring a, a quote from Gerald Soren's very interesting book that came, actually excellent book that came out uh, two years ago. Uh, and the, uh, the title is Howard Fest, Life and Literature in the Left Lane. Now, unfortunately, he couldn't come today to this event, I mean, uh, uh, Gerald Sorin, Professor Sorin. So uh, this is a quote. If Fest were not already glued tightly to the Communist Party of the United States within which he was worshipped, the Paris experience by itself might have supplied eni enough adhesive to the job. Kissed on the lips by Pablo Picasso, Seated next to Louis Aragon, poet, novelist, and co-chair of the conference, and not far from Paul Robson, Fest was transported into another world, where communists were honored, not hunted down and imprisoned. Indeed, for all the days he was in Paris, Fest felt warmly welcomed, loved, his feet rarely touched the ground. In uh, one of the days, in April 1949, at the World Congress in Paris, the same, the novelist Alexander Fadeev, chairman of the Soviet Writers' Union, so the writer number one Soviet, who headed the Soviet delegation, intimated to Fest the following information that is essentially disinformation. So what was with this information? The Soviet government had found out that the American Jewish Appeal and the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee formed a front for a world conspiracy against the Soviet Union. This is a secret. I say it with you now, yes. When Now, moreover, all ghetto, and it's really how they describe it, all ghetto Jews, so Jews who are still traditional and Yiddish speaking, in the Soviet Union were part of that co conspiracy. When the poet Itzik Pfeffer visited, and it's a continuation of the story, visited in 1943 the United States as a representative of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, he was recruited, of course, as an American spy. <laughs> On his return to the Soviet Union, Pfeffer succeeded in Lorik almost all members of the committee in his anti-Soviet organization, but he failed to recruit Solomon Michaels, chairman of the committee, who threatened to denounce Pfeffer and his co-spies. Therefore, Pfeffer organized Michaels' liquidation in Minsk in January 1948. This was the story. Beautiful, yeah? It seems, uh, it's, it's, it's not a story, it's mine now. Yeah? Uh, it seems that in order to provide a factual basis for this grotesque legend, Pfeffer, a secret police informer himself, it, his position demanded from him to be a police informer, was dispatched to Minsk, though he had no reason to be there, actually. According to Fest, Novik, whom Weber kept calling the twongy little Jew, Von Fevater Yidl, this is every time that he called him Von Fevater Yidl, and Von Fevater is, mm, this is uh, was one of the few people from the American delegates, uh, 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 whom the American delegates uh, later led into this secret. It was a serious accusation, especially as Novik uh, had already been accused in suppressing any mentioning 
of the arrested Soviet Yiddish writers. A former Morgan Freiheit writer argued that this ban was introduced in November 49, uh, coinciding with the liquidation of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. So somehow hinting that he was in, in, informed about this. For all that, Novik didn't hurry to react to publication of Fest's interview, waiting apparently for instructions from the party apparatus. Eventually, in August 1957, Literaturna Gazeta, the central organ of the Soviet Writers' Union informed its readers that FAST had broken with the Communist Party, becoming a deserter under fire, how they defined it, and an author of anti-Soviet slander. In general, it can be a separate topic, a separate research of the campaign against FAST in the Soviet Union after 1957. This was a remarkable, absolutely remarkable, the scale and the energy of this. And actually, he always remained a bad guy. And it's, uh, it is interesting to compare with other writers, say, uh, Sholomash, also departed in 1950. He departed from communists. He, never, he wasn't a communist, but at that time, he, he was a contributor to the communist newspaper. He departed, and still, he continued to be defined in the Soviet Union as you know, a writer with some problems, but still a talented writer. And even in, in the, in the mid-1960s, a volume of uh, uh, Ash stories translated into Russian came out in Moscow. So it was, but fast, never. Though I had a chance to see in Moscow his film Spartacus. I don't know how it, it Spartacus, maybe it wasn't mentioned, or maybe they didn't realize actually that it was like my students, that it was somehow linked with Howard Fast. Following his, this publication, Novik wrote to uh, Fast a long, angry letter, categorically rejecting a Fast assertion. And he wrote, the story that somebody, uh, uh, whoever it might be, reported to me about the conversation with Fadeev in Paris is a fabrication. In his reply, Fast reiterated his uh, uh, accusation, and, and I quote, I have lied to myself and to all my principles for many years. I do not lie now. As you may think of me in what I now do, uh, so must I wonder how people of any integrity and character can continue to support a monstrous murder, mach uh, murder machine that includes anti-Semitism as only one of its Vices. Have you no heart, no reason, no conscience? Neither you nor, nor I ever whispered when they murdered David Belgelson. Doesn't that bother you? This was the answer. In a month's time, so it took uh, Novik more than a month's time, uh, Rovik wrote to Fast a long letter, no doubt. Fest's uh, this mentioning that they both uh, had not even whispered was particularly hurting. And I quote uh, a, a short paragraph from this, a couple of phrases actually from this long letter. There's a, a bitter irony in your question whether I am not bothered by the murder of Belgelson. For years we have been running after you to try to find out, to do something. You, the Harvard Fest of those days, the receiver of the Stalin Peace Prize might have been able to do something, to get information. You were not so bothered and were busy with other things. I don't condemn you so much for this, but certainly there is no truthfulness in equating my interest in the matter with your lack of interest at the same time. And, and this letter was in Yiddish actually stronger, and afterwards I told you it was a bit toned down in, in, in English. Fast revisited the past uh, in his 1990 book, Being Read. So the first book about his departure was in 1957, and this in 1990. It is not only about his departure, it's more autobiography, but also contains some uh, uh, pages about uh, this story. When Being Read uh, came out, Novik was not alive to comment on this radically different and improbable a record of uh, events. In fact, the book is full of striking uh, inaccuracies. For instance, the, the poet Itzik Pfeffer, who wasn't a combatant in World War II, appears as, quote, an officer in the Red Army who had fought 
gallantly to the defense of, of Russia during the Nazi invasion and was a hero of the Soviet Union. He wasn't a hero of the Soviet Union. He, he had some uh, just, just a decoration. Uh, the 1990 version doesn't mention the whole story of Pfeffer's conspiracy. According to Fest, the secret session with Fadeev was set up on the fringes of the World Peace Congress because shortly before the trip, Novik authorized Fest to deliver the message that the National Committee of the Communist Party had decided to issue a charge of anti-Semitic practices against the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, that it's very difficult to believe that anyone in the Communist movement at that time would do it. One can get an impression that Fest had lost the last copy of his 1957 book, The Naked God, and therefore created a completely different account of his trip to Paris. This is remarkable, you know, to write in 1957 one uh, story and a completely different uh, in how many years later. In 1957, Fest's interview and letter wounded, but didn't convince Novik. He still maintained that the communist blot on communism uh, had not undermined the ideology proper. Therefore, the situation in the communist movement was not hopeless. Still, Fest's example played a role in Novik's gradual transformation. Remember, I gave a quote in the beginning, which ultimately, 15 years later, in 1972, led to his expulsion from the Communist Party. He was uh, expelled as a nationalist, as a Jewish nationalist. That was, to him, it was shocking. Uh, so, a sort of a conclusion. I believe that in the letters preserved at the EVA archive, I found a sort of an ex explanation for an episode in the story or for around the Jewish anti-fascist committee that, uh, and the story that didn't make sense before. This correspondence brought some element of logic to Itzik Pfeffer's trip to Paris. The Soviets were trying to sell fast an explanation as to why the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee had been uh, shut down. So fast letters to Novik exposed the story that Soviet agencies had created to cover up their real actions. Mikhoyls was sent to Minsk on an official business in January of 1948. He was ostensibly supposed to be expecting, inspecting the Yiddish theater and the Belarusian theater there as a member of the Stalin Price Committee. And suddenly one morning in his hotel, the same hotel, Isik Pfeffer appeared. And we know this because Mikhoyls made a telephone call to his wife back home and he said, Pfeffer is here. And then Pfeffer himself later mentioned many times that, yes, he, he was in Minsk. It was noteworthy because uh, Pfeffer couldn't explain wh what he was doing there. There are various stories about Pfeffer's ro role there at this time. Why would uh, he have been sent to Minsk? And why did he seem embarrassed to be there without a ready explanation for his presence? It turns out, according to uh, the Novik Fest correspondence, that prior to the murder, the Soviet secret police ha ha had concocted a story to explain Mikhoyls' death and about who was responsible for it. It seemed that the script writers of the secret police created this scenario, sort of a just-in-case scenario, before uh, Mikhoyls' murder, and in order to justify uh, this scenario, they dispatched Pfeffer to Minsk. And Pfeffer himself, whose position of secretary of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee required him to be an agent of the secret police, didn't understand what he was doing there. In other words, he certainly had nothing to do with planning the murder. But his presence there ostensibly made the whole explanation for the murder plausible. All in all, we have a Yiddish story of Harvard Fest, a person who had nothing to do with Yiddish literature and yet ended up playing an influential role in, in, in this field. I believe uh, Fess's departure played a major role in pushing not only Novik, but also many other people in his circle, in Novik's circle, out of the party. At the same time, for Fest himself, the persecution and execution of the Jewish anti-fascist committee member uh, played an important role in his decision to break with the communist movement, so Yiddish from both sides. In other words, it is a case of uh, collateral damage incurred from first Stalinism and second destalinization. 
It is a page of history, of American Jewish history. In the 1950s, thousands of people were leaving the American and other Western Communist parties in their organizations. It was the end of the Communist Party as a significant phenomenon in Jewish life. In the early 50s, before this destalinization, about 50% of the American party was Jewish, and the communist Yiddish daily Morgan Freiheit had a similar uh, circulation to that of the English newspaper, and sometimes even higher. They were sitting one floor, I don't remember who was high and who was, but it was the, the same with the Central Committee, not far from Union Square. So in the story of this decline, the role of uh, Harvard Fest was central, not only to Yiddish speaking, cut-carrying communists, cut-carrying virtually, they didn't have cuts actually, cut-carrying communists, but to Soviet sympathizers in the American Jewish community as a whole. Thank you. I understand that we now uh, have uh, uh, time for questions, if, if you have any questions. This, yeah. Is it known if... Uh, he joined, first of all, when we speak about 1939, there, there was, of course, a decline, but the main decline, the main departure was not in, in 1939, but in 1929. In 1929, with the, with the Hebron uh, pogrom, in 1930, in 1939, yes, yes, that's right, that's right. But according to uh, memoirs of communists of that time, uh, this, uh, it was not so much the departure of people in 1939 after this uh, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact as as departure as departure as a departure of those who advertised in in uh, the newspaper of those who sponsored communist activity. So this was the main. As for Harvard Fest at that time. He wasn't involved. He became a member of the Communist Party in 1943. So his attitude, I don't know what his attitude was, but certainly he wasn't in the circle of communists in 1939. He was just a writer. Do you know if uh, Fast had any connection with the Hungarian writer Arthur Kessler, who was a avid communist and then left uh, after writing Darkness at Noon? Yes, that's, I don't know if, if there were uh, direct links. I am not, I can't say that I'm a specialist in Howard Fast's uh, biography in general, yes. But certainly you're right, it's a, a, an interesting parallel. At that time, quite a few uh, significant writers left. And the impression that I have that uh, Howard Fast's departure was uh, or produced much more noise than any other departure. Because he was in, in the hierarchy of uh, the communist movement, he was very high with the Stalin Prize and in general uh, the intellectual number one and so on. So his departure was very painful and as a result it was much more, uh, what is it, discussed and more often discussed than any other department. But of course we can uh, draw parallels as well. May I ask you, you did not mention Ehrenburg. He took part in Congress in Paris. Yes, yes, yes. And I remember a picture Ehrenburg with Fast. Yes. What was his role? His role was, once again, uh, Ehrenburg uh, uh, came with stories that everything is fine. And, and in general, this was a common denominator of such stories. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, they were friendly. This, this was one of the problems uh, later when Fast uh, departed, that many writers, Soviet writers, considered Fast uh, as their friend. I don't know what, was, what kind of a friendship 
he had with Boris Polyway. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Polyway didn't speak any, any, any English and, and Howard Fest certainly didn't speak any Russian. So maybe they, they couldn't communicate even in Yiddish because neither, neither Fest nor Polyway, who wasn't even Jewish, could uh, speak the language. But, uh, but still, they, uh, they considered themselves uh, being uh, friends. And there was one writer that, of course, you know, Nikolai uh, Shipachev, who visited him in, in America. And later, after 1957, it became a sort of his full-time job to write about Howard Fest, how horrible he was. And there were, in, in this campaign, there were a sort of some almost anti-Semitic uh, tones. So it wasn't mentioned that he was Jewish or whatever, but every time it was money, 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 that Fest decided to leave the communist movement because more money. Because uh, he realized that he would get more money outside the movement. And of course, it was a clear, especially in, in the context of the 1950s, it was a, a clear reference to some a Jewish conspiracy or, or just the Jewish habit of making money, money, money. Yeah. So this was. I, I, I don't understand basically. Yeah, Fest was supposed to be an intellectual. Didn't he see what's going on with the communists in the Soviet Union at the time after the revolution? We can, we, I can, uh, we can create a list of thousands and thousands names of intellectual. Pablo Picasso mentioned here was also an intellectual, yeah? but he was a member of the Communist Party. And then the way we can bring many, many other n names of people who are overwhelmed with the project. If you take uh, travel logs of those who visited the, the Soviet Union in the 1920s, it's very e interesting to, to read. With my bias, I read mainly in Yiddish, or mainly Jewish authors. All of them were thrilled. They loved almost everything that uh, they had a chance to see in the Soviet Union. And I am not speaking about uh, communists. I am speaking actually about anti-communists. Even the editor of uh, Forwards, Abe Khan, who was you know, a com really an anti-communist, he visited the Soviet Union in 1927. And he was critical about some sides, but he was happy. And, and at that time, he was happy, actually, that Trotsky, once again Trotsky, that Trotsky was pushed aside by Stalin, and he wrote in, in uh, uh, some interviews and then in, 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 in letters that Stalin, uh, Trotsky is uh, really, he's full of blood. And he hated Trotsky, he had his personal experience with Trotsky here in New York. But uh, uh, Stalin, and I quote, looks as a reasonable man. They believed, yes, yes, they believed that Stalin would bring democracy. I just published, I've got a, 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 a print off of my article uh, that came out virtually a couple of days ago, uh, how the forwards discussed the Stalin constitution published in 1936. About 80 letters were published in the forwards. Once again, the forwards was already clearly 1936, a bitter anti-communist. 50% of readers, at least those who send letters, it was an open, supported the constitutions. They, they loved lack of democracy because they argued that democracy was wrong, democracy brought Hitler to power, democracy in the United States was wrong, and we love this idea of, you know, one-party system, you know, to keep it in... in so, now it's difficult to understand, but... They, did, they didn't have to live in the Soviet Union. They came as a visitors. That's, that's maybe right. the explanation. It, it was if they had a, to live there, yeah. that would have been a different book. Yes, yes, that, 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 that's right. It, it helped a, a lot, yes. Could you comment on the validity of the story that a visiting Paul Robeson insisting on seeing uh, yeah. Itzik Pfeffer, Itzik Pfeffer. Yeah. Uh, a patched up Pfeffer was already uh, incarcerated and brought to, uh, to Robeson's hotel room, fearing that they, uh, uh, they were uh, wired, uh, had to pantomime his condition. 
and the helpless Robeson did no more than add the partisan song to his concert in Moscow. You're right. It is the story many uh, uh, times I'm quoted. I, I even recently I read uh, another version of this story, that Howard Fast came to Moscow. It's in one of the books of, in, of memoirs that how, he never visited Moscow, that he came to Moscow and the, that he wanted ostensibly to see his friend Paris Marcus. And the same story, that, the Paris, that, they, that they went to his family, took a nice uh, suit and brought him to a hotel and so uh, the story with Paul Robson, uh, given the fact that uh, uh, it was uh, repeated hundreds of times, it looks as a document. On the other hand, I'm not sure that it really happened. Because it was not a story that, was, uh, that we know from Paul Robson. It's a story uh, that we know that his son heard from his, his father. As a historian, it's not just an oral history. It's a questionable history. And, and even when you read that Pfeffer, uh, some used a body yeah. language to show that it, it... I am sorry, I don't believe. I don't believe it that it's, it, it, it really uh, it was possible to happen. It, it sounds as a beautiful story, period. Could you please tell something about the repercussions in 1929 of the Hebron massacre? It was very serious. This was really a crisis, much more serious crisis for the communist movement than 1939. With a very significant departure, losing readers, losing uh, writers, and uh, this was this was a, it's, it's a separate story. I wrote uh, about it, so I, I can uh, spend a lot of time uh, talking about this. But essentially. This was the case, a very serious crisis. And actually, uh, Paul Novik later, in his correspondence by the end of his uh, membership at the party, because he was pushed out from the party for nationalism, and he wrote about it to the Central Committee of the party, and actually, I believe, to the uh, chairman of the party, that, look, in 1929, we had this experience, and it was a horrible experience. We lost a lot. Our party became, it was, you know, shrinking, a process of shrinking of the readership and so on. So uh, it was our mistake to do it, and it, this was really very serious. Serious. I, well, what happened? Okay, I, it, it, what, what happened? In, in August uh, 1929, there was uh, uh, anti Jewish violence in uh, Palestine. People were murdered, and usually it is associated with Hebron, but it was not only in Hebron, mainly in Hebron. And initially, uh, the uh, communist press in uh, New York came out with articles that, you know, these Arabs were murdering, murdered Jews, actually on the side of Jews. At that time, th there was no internet, and it took some time for the Comintern to send a message that was completely different. In, in a few days' time, the same newspaper, Freiheit, came out with a completely different story about, uh, uh, Jewish, uh, uh, about Zionists, who together with British colonizers, imperialists, and so on, was oppressing the Arabs, and it was justified you know, to start this uh, violence and so on. And of course, this created a problem and it, it created uh, uh, for, uh, the story of departure of quite a few intellectuals and uh, numerous, numerous readers, uh, from, uh, mainly from the newspaper. This is the story, to make it short. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> did you say uh, Fast uh, knew Arthur Kessler? Uh, no, no, I, I didn't. Oh. Oh. I, I said that I, I, I have no idea. <clears throat> well, um, Kessler wrote uh, a book on uh, Spartacus called uh, The Gladiators. I, I think it was written in the 30s, I'm not sure. But it, it kept very much closer to the facts of why the slave rebellion uh, failed rather than uh, a very romanticized uh, view uh, that uh, Fast had of the uh, 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 Spartacus uh, uprising. <clears throat> did, 
do you know that um, uh, fast uh, uh, understood uh, that there was a, a great difference between what he was writing uh, and, and the actual uh, events? Uh, Stanley Kubrick himself, uh, he only made, Kubrick only made 13 movies, but the only one he, he uh, considered was not a movie of his is because he came in late to Spartacus and he always said uh, the wrong book was made into the movie and what he meant was the Kessler uh, book. Uh, was there any uh, conflict there? Yeah, uh, in, 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 in the Soviet Union we read a different Spartacus number three. What was his an Italian name, Giovanni or something? It was a, a different Spartacus that we read. Uh, I believe that he wasn't a historian. He wrote based loosely on history. Even the story of him uh, giving two different, completely different accounts of the same event in Paris, one of them in 1957, in a completely different story that he published in 1990, illustrates that he wasn't a historian and he wasn't a person careful with, with, with facts and, and details. He wrote a miser. And, uh, and I might say, you know, he had a license as a, as a, as a writer, and I, I believe he, he believed that he had this license to create this, what we know better maybe from this Kirk Douglas, you know. <laughs> How would Faust have a younger brother, Julius, Julie he was called, who was a very prolific writer of uh, what might have been looked down upon by many of the intellectuals of the 30s and might have been called trash, but he got published, I would say, hundreds of times for articles, essays, uh, biographic material, how-tos. Uh, he, he wrote uh, very eclectically. Can yes. you tell us anything about what might have been some either emulation or a, a quest by his younger brother to break away from this uh, highly publicized writer. And if you don't mind, this man has been trying to get the mic. I'd like to pass it to him. <laughs> yeah, I know very little. I, I know more or less was, you, you, you just mentioned, that he was very prolific, that he was popular, and now he's forgotten. This I know. And I know that he wrote uh, scores of titles uh, that were successfully published. But what yeah. happened in the family? Is there any... It was a talented, it, it seems that it was a very talented family. Because look, Fest, who uh, uh, somehow m managed to uh, finish a school, that, that's all. And from what I read, and I'm not sure how reliable it was, he started making money on uh, helping students to write essays. And, and uh, he spent a lot of time at public library, and as a result, this was his education partly. And actually, he was making money on, on this, uh, uh, you know, back up, back to create a, creating a backup for, stu for, stu for students for many years. Even when he already published his first uh, writings, for many years he was, uh, he was doing it. But it was also, uh, he argued it at least, that it was also his way of uh, getting uh, a better education because in order to write an essay, he had to spend some time to, to, to read a, very, a self-made man. I know very little about his brother. Maybe it was a, uh, a joint exercise in, in, in self-education. I have no idea. I, uh, if I may, I think I heard you say that uh, after Khrushchev's secret speech, uh, that the influence of the Communist Party of the United States began to decline. Um, my mother-in-law, uh, for years, wanted to translate Gone with the Wind uh, into Russian. She was a, uh, an honored, uh, distinguished, and well-known uh, Russian translator. She got a copy of the book. Uh, she lobbied, and she worked for uh, uh, Foreign Literature magazine. She lobbied for years to get permission to translate the book, and finally she got it. And the book was translated, uh, and it was going into print. Uh, and suddenly, uh, the uh, production of the book was stopped. 
And the reason that it was stopped was that Gus Hall, who was then the head of the Communist Party of the United States, uh, heard that the book was going to be published in the Soviet Union, and he objected. Uh, and for a while, uh, the publication was held up. Um, two questions. One, uh, do you know anything about this? Uh, and secondly, uh, you said that Howard Fast was the leading intellectual of the Communist Party in the United States. Uh, did he have anything to do with holding up Gone with the Wind? It's, it's for the first time that I, 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 I learn about this story. And actually, I, I don't know, the, what is really, uh, what I mentioned, I, I didn't mention that it was really a decline of the Communist Party. I mentioned that it was a decline of the Jewish participation in the Communist Party. This was a, a difference. Actually, after 1957, for a while, the Communist Party generally lost thousands of its members. But then they managed to recruit many other, more from different segments of the population. And this was the moment when they decided, uh, when they once again were strong, they decided that the time came came to get rid of this old, stubborn Jews like Novik and some other people who believed that they were the real Leninists, not the people in, in Kremlin, but they were the real Leninists. So they, uh, this was the moment when they started getting rid of these veterans who were, who were not essential anymore. You know, at, at that time, they reinforced, they uh, attracted new people. So it was not really, uh, it was a crisis for the, uh, the party, but a temporary crisis that they, they came back. In addition, look, in, in uh, uh, American history, the American Communist Party was always quite small. It was a sort of a, uh, a, sort of a sect rather than a, a party. It wasn't France, it wasn't Italy. So we are speaking about thousands. You know. In, in, in some moments, there were maybe uh, 30,000, maybe, maybe more, but, but never, it wasn't ne never a party of, of really significance. Yeah. Yes, um, since it was already asked you, and I, I didn't quite understand in terms of your sources here, or your, to the Paul Robeson story, um, that uh, you don't think it took place because what it wasn't corroborated in what way would it have have to be believable I don't I heard the story from Paul Robeson jr. who was answering questions at a private gathering as to what his father uh, did when he went back to the Soviet Union and didn't he ever learn after his passport was, was restored, didn't he ever learn what was really going on there, had been going on? And he told the story and um, that the, well, he's, he's a dignitary, he's being honored. Why wouldn't someone be brought to him to visit with him and to tell, let him know as best he could what had occurred to Michals? And then when he had an opportunity to sing on the ra that was broadcast on the radio, he sang in Yiddish, which was... Um, at the, in that context, a uh, courageous thing to do. I'll tell That's you. His, that was a story. I yeah, heard. this is the story. Yeah. At the same time, uh, not all the archives are open nowadays uh, in the Soviet Union, but quite a significant uh, portion uh, became available and published. There's a historian, Gennady Kostyshenko, who published already, I don't know how many titles, based on his excavations in the uh, uh, Soviet archive, specifically about the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. And this Gennady Kostyshenko, maybe in, in the terms of uh, creating concepts and so on, maybe he's not such a star, but he's excellent in delivering the stuff, taking from the archive, presenting, putting 25 footnotes, and, 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 and so on. Yeah. But very reliable guy. There was no mentioning in any, there the, are the minutes published, uh, no, no, not full minutes, but a significant number, uh, amount of minutes of the trial and so on. It was never mentioned that Pfeffer and Paul Robson, in general, it's, it's a story that is hanging somehow separately. And it's suspicious, it's too beautiful. 
you know, too nice and too and too romantic for for this time. I I I, I simply I don't have documents, but but I don't believe in the context of the time that it was necessary. It was easier to sell Paul Robson the same story. Itzik Pfeffer became a spy and to, 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 rather than to, to, uh, to, to create this sort of a show with this, uh, you know, ostensibly showing who needed it. There was no need. It was easier to sell something, especially as Paul Robson was a committed communist and he remained a committed communist. He didn't depart. I, okay, the, st the story is that Paul Robson came and, 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 and uh, asked, okay, where is Pfeffer? Where is my friend Pfeffer? And, and that uh, he, uh, they told, okay, a, a couple of, give us a couple of days, and a couple of days uh, Pfeffer ap appeared, somehow not exactly in the best shape, but in a very nice suit. Yeah, that, that was brought, and, and that uh, there was a, a short conversation at the Pfeffer, uh, uh, somehow used the body language to show that, uh, it's, that it, it is something bad is happening. This is this story, essentially. I thought it was Beck Hoyles that Robson asked about. No, no, it was, it was Pfeffer. It was Pfeffer. Uh, yeah, okay. Once again, there are different stories. Oh, Recently I read about Fast and, and, and Paris Marquis, that is completely uh, 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 a story impossible because Harvard Fast didn't Visit Moscow. What about the radio broadcast and the concert? Was that is that documented? No, 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 no. The, the, the false, the, the concert really. This was the case. Yeah, the fall, the concert. This oh. is a effect. The con, the, the concert wow. really. This existed, and Paul Robson really was singing in Yiddish and in Hebrew. So this was really. This is the reality. Yeah. I one more question. Yeah, I was. Oh, oh. Well, um, I was just wondering if possibly you could just back up just a little bit and tell us something about what made Howard Fast join the Communist Party, become a communist. What was it, especially in 1943 when he was working for the OWI? What was the impelling factor or factors? Is it something he read? Is it something that uh, information that he got through his work about what was happening with the Soviet Union during the war? Uh, is it uh, something that happened when he just was in the public library? I mean, what was it that impelled him to adopt this uh, value system? It was the war, the war, and the leading role of Russia in fighting against the Nazis. It was, ob 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 obviously it was, at, at that time it was very appealing. And at that time, you know, when Mikhoels and Pfeffer, may maybe they contributed actually to this. There were gatherings of 40,000 people and, and, and sometimes le le less of thousands and thousands of people. And for Jews especially at that time, uh, when, and, and mind you, in 1942, by the end of 1942 and in 1943, the first information started coming ab about what later became known as the Holocaust. So, and, and the only hope was the Soviet Union at, at that time. It seemed that it, it was, it, it was the, uh, if we, you, we support the Red Army and if we support the fight on the Eastern Front, then we save Jews will help saving Jews. So it, it was, and, and, and not only the Jewish aspect, in general the anti-Nazi aspect. So uh, the Soviet Union, the stakes of, of the Soviet Union during the war became very high. And, and it was a new enrollment into the Communist Party, in the communist organizations, it was really, really in, in this climate. So the, the very last uh, question, yes, who and... and To the Jewish state, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I. I, 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 I believe. Do you mean at the moment when the Jewish state was established? Certainly, it was very positive because at that time, every yeah, every member of the Communist Party, of uh, any Communist Party, welcomed the establishment of the State of Israel because, or especially, because the Soviet Union supported the establishment of the party. This, was, this is one of the paradoxes, that communists supported the establishment of the state together with the Soviet Union. Then the Soviet Union changed its attitude 
to Israel, but a significant and may, maybe the majority, the, the, the most significant part of the communists, including of Novik's circle, continued to support Israel. This was one, therefore he was expelled as a nationalist eventually. For, 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 for his, a, a sort of a frozen attitude to Israel, frozen of the time of the establishment of, of, of Israel. This is a sort of a paradox. Of, said, for a free Medina Israel. Yeah, for Medina Israel, for a free uh, state of Israel. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.